Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Okay, it's an honor to be here speaking uh, before everybody today on behalf of Cease Fowler, Illinois. I'm glad to see my friend Craig here, uh, homegrown here in Little Rock, right? That's right, okay, good. Yeah, tell you a little bit more about myself, and I appreciate the introduction. It's, like I said, it's an honor to be here to uh, former president, you know, Bill Clinton, uh, School of Public Service, which is really important because the message has to get out, and I've been a public servant for a long time, as you can see with my bio. And ceasefire is all about changing the way people think about violence, changing mindsets, because it's, it's hard to change conditions and circumstances all the time. So if you can change the way people think, you can get, get something done, in other words. The work of ceasefire has been backed up by two independent evaluations. The Department of Justice actually ordered an evaluation on our work. Uh, you can go on the ceasefire website. You can find the, the results of the evaluations. And then uh, recently, John Hopkins Institute in uh, Baltimore, uh, the work we've done in the city of Baltimore has proven to get some results as well. And now ceasefire is a, is a worldwide model that we use. And before I get into the PowerPoint, I'll get into that. But I always tell a quick story when it comes down to change in mindsets before I start my presentation. There was this uh, airplane, and I tell this story as an icebreaker as well. There was this airplane that was about to crash. You had four passengers on the airplane. You only had three parachutes. That's the problem. And you had uh, the pilot, a boy scout, a preacher, and you had a guy that thought that violence was OK. So the pilot took the first parachute. He jumped, leaving, two pass leaving three passengers and only two parachutes. The guy that thought that violence was OK, a way of life, he gangstered the other parachute because he had a gun. He took the parachute, and he jumped, leaving one parachute, the uh, pastor, and the boy scout. So the pastor went to the corner of the plane, and he asked God to help him out of this situation. And the Boy Scout tapped him on his shoulder and said, you know what? God already helped you out. The guy that gangstered the parachute, he didn't take the parachute. He took my backpack. You got me? <laughs> so uh, that's just an icebreaker for you. And uh, that's what happens when you pull out a gun. People end up going down. That's the moral of the story. And a lot of young guys don't understand that um, when you know violence should not be the first option for you. In the city of Chicago, violence has reached epidemic levels due to the fact that you have a lot of young guys from the 70s that misled the brothers from the 80s, and the brothers from the 80s misled the brothers from the 90s, and the beat goes on. Chicago was like one of the birthplaces for some of the major uh, street organizations known to society, you know, the Blackstone Rangers, Gangster Disciples. 30,000 strong, 50,000 strong, but you don't have those particular big organizations in Chicago today. You have factions and you have different cliques of those kind of organizations. So just want to share that with you also as a little background. So ceasefire and plan to go. These are, this is what I plan to cover, the, the nature and the theories of violence, mission of ceasefire, critical elements, and team member roles, and data, data to demonstrate the model's effectiveness. And uh, the main thing when it comes down to demonstrating the model's effectiveness is to have testimonial about from people that you work with and help, you know, because I can speak to you up, from standing up here, but it's always good to have testimonials from the people that you've impacted. Homicide is the second leading cause of death among Americans aged 15 to 34, but for African American youth, it's the leading cause of death between the ages of 16 and 25 due to the fact there's a lot of reasons because you have a lot of interpersonal conflict going on in some of these communities and people just don't know how to get along with one another. That's the reason why you need some people to intervene on the front end and do the best you can to try to help people along the way. Number of killings in, uh, number of killings in 10 largest U.S. cities from 2000 to 2009. You can see Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, they're right at the top of the line there. But Chicago right now, in the year 2012 right now, Chicago reached 400 homicides by the end of September, which was yesterday. And this is for the first time in 10 years, Chicago has reached the 400 mark. And we'll talk about that more as we keep, it, keep the presentation going. But you can see in this chart here, Chicago and New York. But you know, New York has tripled the number of people than Chicago. So New York, you would think New York would definitely be right there at the top. But they've made a lot of changes in New York City to get it down over the years. So right here in Chicago in 2010, there were um, 436 homicides and 1,845 shootings in Chicago, tripled the national homicide rate. So it goes to show you the magnitude of the problem in Chicago. And homicide is the leading cause of death, like I say, for that age range. And all other efforts to improve systems and services for Chicagoans are less effective without violence reductions. A lot of times they just had the teacher strike in Chicago, just give you an example. Uh, the teachers can only do so much. It's not a teacher's job to discipline people coming to schools. It's not a teacher's job to understand everything the kids have to go through on their way to school. 
it's hard to deal with all that stuff. So trying to grade teachers based on their performance, that's important. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, you have to deal with the issues outside the school because if kids are traumatized before they get to school, that's a tough order for a lot of people. Now, I grew up in the Henry Horner Projects, and I can say this comically today because God has moved me a long way. I'm not a religious guy, but I'm a spiritual guy. And um, what happened is I know how it is to grow up in absolute poverty. I know how it is to open up a refrigerator and you don't have nothing to eat in the refrigerator. Some people probably never experienced it, and I, and I hope you never do, but I know how it is being 13, 14 years old. You, you, know, you want to get something to eat, your stomach is growling, and next thing you know, you go out on the streets and your friends say, hey, man, you can make $50 just hanging out here with us for about a few hours just to be like a watch out, a lookout for me. And that's your introduction to the game for some of these young guys out here because circumstances dictate some people's outcomes. And don't get me wrong, even though I grew up in the projects, I was able to get it all together and keep it moving because something was, I was born with something in me. I guess that little extra step I had in me to overcome, you know, poverty and, and, and uh, obstacles in life. And that's why I'm here today as a result of my, everything I've learned, you know, growing up. So you see the, um, the, the bodies on the map. Most of the homicides are concentrated on the south side of Chicago and the west side of Chicago and some northwest side communities. But uh, like I said, you had 1,800 shootings last in 2010. But this is the thing. If you, do an, if you run the average of anywhere from 450 to 600 homicides in Chicago a year over the last 10 years and you average it down to 500 a year, that's 5,000 people being killed in 10 years in Chicago. 85% African-American black-on-black homicides in Chicago right now. And if you do the math on an average of 1,800 shootings a year for, for the last 10 years, that's 18,000 people being shot in a city like Chicago. So to me, that's, that's definitely an epidemic level, and we have to do the best we can to help people understand because right now it's kind of getting out of control. So the killing costs all of us. Each year, Americans suffer from more than 18,000 homicide, 18, homicides, and it costs them more than $47 billion. So the toll, the cost of homicides, dealing with all the victims and all this kind of crazy stuff, hospital bills and all that, it's really, the, the price escalates. It's astronomical, really. Education, while most U.S. schools remain relatively safe, school violence has, has been recognized as a significant public health problem. So Dr. Gary Sluckin is the founder of Ceasefire. I'm the director of Ceasefire Illinois, and I'm the guy that created the Violence Interrupters that was made into a documentary because I got tired of seeing these young guys being killed out here, and I want to stop it more on the front end. Changing a person's mind is one thing, but it takes time to change somebody's mind, so I had to come up with something that can stop the guys in their tracks right now. That's the reason why I created the Violence Interrupters. But like I said earlier, uh, dealing with the school issue, uh, there was a guy that was beaten to death in Chicago named Darion Albert. This happened about a year and a half ago. You were in town, I believe, at the time. And Darion Alba was beaten to death. Guys had been uh, transferred from one school to another school, and they had this Renaissance 2010 program going on from the Chicago Public Schools. So they would transfer some kids, not understanding the, the consequences that these kids would have to deal with when they had to go to another neighborhood. So that's what happened to Darion. And you would think that the violence in Chicago would stop after what happened to Darion Albert. And it reminded me of what happened to Emmett Till many, many years ago, I mean decades ago, because you would think, you would, you would hear guys, when Darian Albert was being beaten to death, you heard guys with their cell phones saying, zoom in, zoom in. Nobody thought to say, stop it. Everybody was like, they went from zero to 10, just like that. And this guy was beaten to death, and nobody really paid attention to it. And recently, one of the guys that was convicted for killing Darion Albert, he's, he made a comment in the newspaper. He said, I just was not thinking. That's his comment. He said, I was not thinking. And that's what happens with a lot of these young guys. They don't get a chance to think because they're living on the edge right then and there. So that's what's going on as far as the educational system. Theories about possible causes of violence. You know, violence is learned from role models. That's the theory that we take, uh, put out there. Uh, I was talking to some students earlier today. Michael Vick is a personal friend of mine, NFL quarterback. I love animals. I want to make that clear. But the reason I'm bringing Michael Vick up is because Michael Vick, at the age of eight years old, he was involved in dogfighting. When Michael Vick got his NFL contract to the tune of $80 million, $100 million, even though he had the money, but his mind was still in the neighborhood. So he was really just doing what he was taught to do early on in his life. So now that he's turned his life around now, and uh, believe it or not, he spent $1 million to rehabilitate the dogs that they had taken off his compound, and only one of the dogs was put down anyway. I want to make that clear. But at the same time, now Michael had to learn that that was not the right type of behavior. It took Michael to go to jail to get that message, and he was able to redeem himself. But a lot of these young guys do not get the opportunity to redeem themselves because they end up killing somebody thinking that it's okay. 
And one thing about uh, the way we look at violence being, it spreads like an infectious disease because it transfers from one person to another person. In case in point, when Darren Albert was beaten to death on the south side of Chicago, you can see how everybody just seemed to have, it just spread, it was like wildfire. Everybody was involved in it. One person had an issue, then 10 people had the issue, next thing you know, 30 people had the issue, and overall you got 100 people out there fighting one another. Because nobody thought to say, look here, man, this is not cool at all. We need to come take a pause for a minute and let this go. So caused by social forces, lack of opportunity, racism, racism and poverty, I can say this much, I can say growing up in the projects, it doesn't mean you have to shoot somebody just because you don't have a job. I'm not going to never agree to that, okay? Some people use it as an excuse, say, well, you know, we don't have a job, we're going to go shoot everybody. I'm not going to agree to that. I know the drug game, uh, back in the 70s, heroin was in the community. The 80s, the crack cocaine epidemic hit, and that ended up taking a lot of people out of their families and a lot of structured life, you know, family settings, and these young guys had to raise themselves. I know that's true, but at the same time, in the 70s and 80s, you had a lot of jobs, but you still had a lot of violence in the communities as well. So is it really a thinking problem or a lack of employment problem? You have to kind of weigh that out as academic people because there's no real concrete evidence that can show you that just because I'm not working, that's the reason violence is going up. As a matter of fact, I put a piece in the Huffington Post. I wrote a piece for the Huffington Post about a, uh, a year and a half ago about unemployment and the rising homicide rate because unemployment was actually down, homicides were up, and at one time, unemployment was up and homicides were down. So when you do your research, you'll see what I'm talking about as it relates to homicides. But a cultural norm in subgroups with a higher rate of homicide. You know, growing up in the projects, once again, homicide was a daily occurrence in the Henry Horner projects. Every day somebody was shot and killed, or either shot. And I mean that literally. And through the projects throughout Chicagoland. So once you become desensitized towards the suffering of other people, then it becomes the norm in a particular community. And then people expect homicide, they expect somebody to be beaten to death or somebody to you know, end up being hurt. I was uh, on my way to mediate a conflict uh, about two years ago. I'm the director of Cease Valley Noise, so I meet with politicians. Matter of fact, I got a chance to meet with Prime Minister David Cameron over in London about a year ago. Met with Queen North from Jordan. And I'm just using these names to show you how far I've come. I come from the projects. I'm, in, I'm meeting with people. I have to go to Scotland next week to present in front of all the police uh, chiefs of the UK. But I still do some street level work at times. So I just want to make that clear. But I was on my way to mediate a conflict. This 18-year-old uh, young man had uh, been grabbed by the resident gang leader in this Austin area. And uh, his mother had an asthma attack, and his sister called him. He was doing security for the drug spot. When he left the, the drug post, the security post, the guys, uh, the police came in and raided the drug spot, and the guys thought he had told on them, and he ran off the scene. So the sister called me. I rushed over to the scene. I got my suit in town. I had just had a meeting with a congressman, right? So I rushed over there, not thinking myself to call some people to meet me over there. So they got this kid in a half circle. They'd already beaten him up pretty bad. And the guy told me, he said, look, what are you coming over here for, man? You know, I put you to sleep. You keep getting in my business. This is what the guy told me. He was like around 32 years old. And I said, what did you say? He said, I'll put you to sleep. You heard what I said. If you keep getting in my business, I'll put you to sleep. And I heard someone click in his pocket. Click. Woo. So uh, I'm reliving this now for a minute. <laughs> so it was kind of strange because when he told me he would put me to sleep, you know, I, I had two choices. Save. Pride goes before the fall, number one. But I was on a mission to save the life of this 18-year-old young man. So I told the guy, I said, look, this guy did not tell on you guys. He legitimately went home to help his mother. If you're going to take his life for this here, I'm not going to tell you what I really had to say because, you know, we're doing this presentation today. But I had to go there with him. I had to join his world and bring him into my world. And as an end result, I'm still standing here today. The young guy's life was saved. Deep situation. So, um... A cultural norm in subgroups with a high rate of homicide, a series of events or interactions between co-disputants that can escalate into homicide. They were willing to kill one of their own, and they didn't even know why they wanted to kill the guy. And I saw that guy about four months later. I was in a McDonald's drive through and he was blowing his horn at me, and he brought his fist up and said, what's up, young? He said something, what's up, big brother? And that was his way of apologizing to me. So you have to understand the street mindset. He couldn't tell me straight up he wanted to apologize to me. So four months later, I saw the guy, how you doing, big brother? And that was cool. Because now image could have kicked in, and I could have said, well, you know what? Those are kind of war words and whatever the case may be. But I was able to let that go because blessed are the peacemakers. God has me on a mission, and I have to fulfill my mission. I have to stay focused, you know, the bottom line. So uh, the cultural norm is that 
I met with some young guys at the age of 12 and 13 years old in the Inglewood community, south side of Chicago. The young guys told me, they, they said, Tio, we actually hate the guys that live two blocks away from us. And I asked some young guys, where did you get the word hate from for the guys that live two blocks from you all? They said they big brothers don't get along with them guys. So they don't get along with them. So the point I'm making how it's uh, handed down behavior, and uh, you can unlearn violent behavior. So what, what, we, what we've been doing lately is I've had a group, because ceasefire, the population of guys we work with are from the ages of 16 to 25, but I have a, another group that I kind of subcontract with, and now I have them bringing them, them, them guys together with the other guys on the other block, and they're playing basketball together, football, because they didn't ever get a chance to know one another. So we hope we can bridge the gap between the younger population now so they can begin talking about it with other young guys. It's very important. But the subculture of violence in Chicago, it runs deep as the river uh, because the subcultures are out there. You got the guys carving their little territory in the sand, and they feel that, look, I'm a south sider, I'm a west sider. They don't get along with us, and everybody just they keeps on pumping the wrong information in these young guys' heads. Okay? So ceasefire, we have a public health approach. Stop shootings and killings, working uh, with those closely associated with the problem. The difference between ceasefire and some other groups, because I don't want to never give ceasefire all the credit, I believe in giving everybody credit for the work they do, but we work with the shooters. We work with the guys that we know that are out there pulling them guns out, shooting one another. We have a criteria that has to be met in order to become a client for ceasefire. We work with the guys that have a violent background, and then a lot of organizations say, look here, we want to work with you guys. So I say, that's fine. But remember, we work with the killers, okay? And when you start bringing these guys at, with their guns around, some people are not cut out to do that kind of work. So you have to really, every, everybody has to play a role, in other words. But we work with, and I would rather work with the shooters and keep them from shooting people any day of the week. And then we've hired over 300 ex-offenders over the last 10 years, and only six of our staff have relapsed into that former lifestyle out of 300 ex-offenders. And, and the beauty about hiring some of the ex-offenders is this. These guys are not breaking the law anymore. A lot of these guys are going back to get their college degrees. They're, they're paying bills. They have cars. They have their homes and apartments now, which is a, a way of repaying their debt to society, which is really a benefit of ceasefire, hiring some of the people we work with. And then working in communities that are disproportionately affected. We, all of our work is based on data. We have to make sure that when we work in a community, we go in the highest need areas with the ceasefire model. That's the reason why we know we get results to a degree. But there's a lot of lightweight controversy with ceasefire sometimes because when you're in the public's eye a lot and you know you're getting credit for reducing homicides, then you run into conflict with the powers that be. Uh, so that's why it's very important for us. Recently, uh, the mayor of Chicago, Superintendent McCarthy, they uh, awarded ceasefire with a $1 million grant to do some work in the Woodlawn community on the south side of Chicago and North Lawndale on the west side of Chicago. But it was not easy because you may have seen me in the news because they wanted us to serve as informants. And what I told them, we cannot serve as informants because our work really, ceasefire's work is a parallel approach to law enforcement. Our job is to stop a guy from crossing the line Therefore, nobody goes to jail, nobody goes to the cemetery, and the police job, if somebody crosses the line, that's when the police get involved. So eventually, when I spoke up, Superintendent McCarthy and the mayor began to understand ceasefire a little bit better. And they allowed us to do the work and, and, and stick to our model, in other words. And it's very important because some people refuse to speak up. Speaking up is very important, especially if you have all your facts. It doesn't matter whether they're going to listen or not. As long as you got the truth out, then you just let deal with it, you know, from, from that point. So providing awareness and education, we try to really educate the public at large that violence should be seen as abnormal behavior. We organize community responses to the violence, but Chicago right now is going to take a major, major effort. I just spent two days with Diane Sawyer from ABC World News last week, and she's going to run a special on uh, you know, the violence in Chicago in about a week from now, and she was really amazed at how tough it is in Chicago herself, because some of the young men I brought out there to talk with her, they were like telling her the truth, and she was taken back. She was like, Man, I can't believe this stuff. So it go, the beat goes on and on, but we're making progress on a lot of areas that we work in. So the ceasefire model, identification and detection. In order to prevent a homicide, you have to have the ability to intercept whispers. Nobody talks about homicide. Trust me what I tell you. If a guy has a hit on him, it's hard to mediate a conflict when a guy has a hit on his life. But some of the issues that a guy may get into it over a dice game, a guy may get into it over a female, a guy get kicked out of a party because uh, the guy's didn't want him in there because he's not from the neighborhood, he goes home to get a gun, and he shoots up the whole party. We mediate conflicts like that all the time on the front end. 
As a matter of fact, in the year 2011, just give you an idea of the magnitude of the services we provide, before we get to the rest of this chart, the, the outreach workers spent 48,000 hours with high-risk youth, over 1,100 high-risk youth in Chicago in the year 2011. 48,000 hours. We calculate everything that we do. The, the violence interrupters mediated over 900 conflicts in the year 2011 in the Chicago area, which 30% uh, of the mediations were front-end mediations where nobody got shot. Another 35% of the uh, mediations were we prevented retaliation. And the remaining 35% were like fights that the staff had to break up because, you know, you can't just take credit for mediating, mediating all conflicts. And I'm not going to tell you no stories about some conflicts that didn't work out because we've had some mediations that when they just didn't work out. People did not want to listen. We had to step back, and that's when law enforcement gets involved. But um, interruption, intervention, and risk reduction change behaviors and norms. And then we, you know, we, uh, uh, we pretty much calculate all of our data, and we monitor everything we do. But changing behaviors takes time. That's the reason why I stress the fact that we spent 48,000 man hours with the guys we work with because you want to spend that quality time with them. And unfortunately, and I just want to use this word unfortunately, because we, we hire ex-offenders and they, all of our staff are professionally trained, but I wish we could hire a, a people that were not ex-offenders in some cases to do the street level work because I'm tired of seeing the guys looking up to ex-offenders all the time. That's the point I'm trying to drive home. I feel that the young guys need to look at professional brothers and sisters, white, black, Latino, it doesn't matter where you come from, because if ex-offenders are the only people that you're going to listen to, what you're doing then, you're setting people up for failure to a degree, because why do you have to be an ex-offender to get street credibility? So I'm trying to really battle back in that situation there because we hire a lot of guys that have serious backgrounds, but I'm trying to get away from that. I wear my suits and ties. I like wearing suits and ties, but you know, your cleaner's bill can be very expensive. But the reason I wear them a lot of times, too, around the neighborhood is because I want the young guys to see that you got professional brothers out there doing this work. You don't always have to wear your pants sagging down and wearing hats and stuff. Do the best you can to become a professional young man, you'll be okay. So that's the, what I'm trying to stress now. So this is the ceasefire model. We identify what's happening, then we detect what's going on and disrupt the spreading of the disease. And uh, the ceasefire model, then, this is a continuation here. Uh, potential shootings and events. The outreach workers and violence interrupters are assigned to a particular area to work in. That's the reason why we mon monitor our work in those particular areas. So they're just like beat officers, police officers who work a beat. They're assigned to the ceasefire zones, which are beats in Chicago. And then we meet with the individuals and groups at highest risk of involvement in a shooting or killing. And I don't believe in faking with nobody. I'll tell you the truth about something. The guys that are out there in the gang lifestyle, they're into that lifestyle, and here you come. You used to be a part of it, but you're not involved in their inner circle every day, all day. So whatever they're doing, smoking their blunts, drinking alcohol, partying or whatever, if you're not out there with them 24 hours a day, it's going to be hard for you to stop somebody from killing somebody because they're not going to see you as one of theirs. In order to get somebody to stop somebody from killing somebody, you have to be a part of their group. You have to be part of them. They have to see you as part of them. That's why the model has been effective with some of the staff we hire because they used to be part of their group in a serious way. That's the only way you're going to be really effective because you're not going to get a stranger coming in all the time stopping these guys from killing one another. And then stopping them from killing is one step. The next step is get them to a higher level of thinking and get them to become productive members of society. That's the higher level work. Because I'll tell you something, this is a true story. I organized a job fair once before at this town hall meeting. I had 300 people show up at the job fair, true story. I told the guys, meet me Monday. It was, the job fair was on a Saturday. Meet me Monday with your resumes. Three people showed up Monday with their resumes. And out of the 300 people at the job fair, everybody was talking about how they wanted to work. They were looking forward to working. And keep in mind, I know some of the guys didn't probably have a resume. I understand that. So I extended. I said, give me your resume in a week from now. Three people showed up to Monday. Nobody showed up a week later. Nobody. And I go to tell you, it goes to show you some people are just not ready. I'm not saying that's like an indication that everybody's not ready, but that particular group, they weren't ready for prime time. So uh, use all sources and possible points of entry. We get notices from law enforcement that something's going on in the community. And nine times out of ten, we already know what's going on because we're out there. So the notices help us out. We have a hospital-based program where we respond to all shooting incidents at uh, Stroger Hospital, Northwestern Hospital in Chicago, and Advocate Christ. And then the doctors are on board with us as well because a lot of the doctors from the hospitals, they got tired of seeing all these young men coming there being shot, shot up and everything. And what's strange about this code of silence and this street life is that some guys will go to their deathbed and will not even talk about who shot them. 
That's how entrenched it is. We had a story where a guy was dying on the streets. The police asked him, who shot you? You know this guy, he, right before his last breath, they thought he was going to say something. He said, tell my kids I say bye. He didn't even talk about who shot him. So what makes you think you're going to go in there and get these guys to say something? They're willing to die and take it to the grave with them opposed to talking about what's going on. So you got to really work on changing that mindset. And um, schools and then calls from the community. We receive calls all the time. You know, I had a grandmother that called me. So you talking about intervention. I had a grandmother that called me three weeks ago from the west side of Chicago. A guy had shot her picture window out in her house on the 3200 block of West Washington. He was trying to shoot and kill her grandson. She had four grandsons. The guy's name, I'm not going to mention his name because we pretty much protect the anonymity of the guys we work with. Um, he shot up in the house. The, he was trying to lure the grandsons to come out the house because they had taken some pictures of him. He got beat up at a lounge a week before that, and the grandsons took pictures of his face all swollen up and posted it on Facebook. Show you how crazy this story gets. The guy could not shoot the guys that beat him up because he couldn't find them. But he knew where the grandsons lived, so he went by their house, shot the front window out, came back, burnt the grandmother's van up, so she ended up calling the police about the van and everything, which was a good thing. But then she called ceasefire because this guy said he wasn't going to listen to nobody. He was going to kill them guys no matter what. So I had, I had to go to the deep streets to get two guys from the clique he was in to make him listen. And as an end result, three weeks later, nobody was shot. Now, I can't give all this information to the police, but I'm just talking to you all about it. We saved the life. It was a graphic situation. It was pretty tough. But no matter what them two guys said to him, he got the message that he shouldn't be shooting nobody, and they told him they better not even catch him on the block again, that particular block. He listened. He stepped away. We saved the life of potentially three or four guys in that one incident. And these are true stories because the grandmother just gave a testimonial on Channel 2 News about how we intervened for her grandsons. So, you know, that's what it's all about to validate our work. But this is how you change mindsets. And now the potential shooter, our outreach workers are working with him now, trying to get him to give his gun up and change his behavior overall. Because, see, you can put the fire out in one incident, but you've got to have a follow-up plan with these guys. Okay? So with that being said, now provide ongoing behavior change and support to individuals using outreach workers and others. That's what the time is all about, the 48,000 hours. Uh, out of the 1,120 people we work with in the year 2011, 35% of the guys, we uh, found employment for the guys. The other 35%, we, en we enrolled them back in school. And the remaining 30%, we're steady working with them. And the way we measure behavioral change is that over the course of a year or two, we uh, work with these young men, and they have not reoffended, which is major. About 80% of our clients have not reoffended. So we're measuring that year to year how these guys are doing. These are guys that have violence in their background. Now they're not reoffending, and that's good for overall society. But one thing different in Chicago now, you do have younger people involved in a lot of the shooting. I'm talking about the age of 13 and 14. That happened in the past as well, but now you got to reach these guys at an earlier age in order to get them to really understand. Because if you don't catch a guy at 13 and 14, what's going to happen is that when they turn 16 or 17, they're too far gone. They're way too far gone. I was sitting in the courtroom. Two young guys, 18-year-old, 18 18-year-olders, 18 were being sentenced to life for a homicide they had committed. And do you know them two young guys were in court playing with each other, not realizing the seriousness of what they're facing right now? They were in court just playing, you know, doing little finger stuff at each other, blowing bubble gum at one another, man. At 18 years old, headed to jail for life, thinking it's a joke. And when they, that's the mindset of some of the young guys, though. Yep. So um, we inform and train individuals in group and groups in specific strategies to bring about behavior change. That's what it's all about because you cannot spend 24 hours a day with the young men, so you have to work on behavior change when you're with them and teach them that it's okay to step down and unlearn violent behavior. We mobilize the community to norm changes, um, to change norms because we organize responses. Whenever somebody gets shot in a ceasefire zone, we organize 200 people to come out, make a lot of noise about the shooting. This is abnormal behavior. Nobody should be getting shot out there. But recently, I've pulled back on organizing responses all the time because I'm trying to get the media to move in another direction. I'm trying to respond when we stop a shooting, opposed to waiting until after somebody gets shot. Because we tried all the marching, and you get the pastors that march. And now, God bless the pastors. I really appreciate the work the pastors are doing. But marching after the fact is not really getting the job done right now. I believe in trying to get it on the front end, then you stop it. Because, for example, what I'm trying to organize now is about 30 families in Chicago that we mediated with on the front end and let them tell their stories, how we stopped it before it happened. And then the media, they'll pick up on it. But when somebody gets shot, they pick up on it in a major way. 
So we're going to have to kind of do like a mind shift with the media to a degree with that. Uh, we sponsor community events, engage faith-based leaders, educate the public, launch and promote Pacific campaigns to enforce key messages and explain expected community roles. So everybody plays a role, in other words. You know, I was hoping when Darion Abbott was beaten to death that we can organi organize about 10,000 people to take to the streets every weekend in Chicago until the brothers got the message that they need to put their guns down. But that didn't happen. Sometimes people come out for the photo ops. They want to look good in the media and talk like they know a lot of good stuff. But the follow-up is what it's all about, rolling your sleeves up. I'm the kind of guy, even though I oversee Cease Fire Illinois, I'm meeting with politicians and, like I say, people on all different levels. But I'm the guy that I still will go out at 2 o'clock in the morning if I have to. Because some people trust me when I come out more than they trust other people because they, they, they know me pretty much. So with that, keep it moving here. So multiple messages to outreach workers, violence interrupters, program managers, and then the three variables. We challenge the social norms, we talk about risk factors, and then we provide them with alternatives to violence, and the outcome is less shootings all the time. Recently, NBA legend Isaiah Thomas came out to the, west, to the south side of Chicago, along with Joaquin Noah and Taj Gibson from the Chicago Bulls, and they organized like a peace tournament, which I thought was good because the young guys that were involved in the peace tournament, you know, I must admit, these young guys listen to athletes, they listen to rappers for whatever reason. And they came out, they were like surprised, they looked like it was Christmas Day for them. And they began to talk and process with one another. So I'm hoping that everlasting peace could be the outcome from this situation. But I really respect the fact that the NBA players came out to really talk to these young guys. So that's one step in the right direction as far as less shootings. Because at any given time, um, an outbreak of violence could take place in Chicago. And you get 40 shootings in a weekend and 10 homicides. Like I said, it spreads like an infectious disease. That can happen at any time in Chicago. Okay. Now, as far as the data, we collect, analyze data from sources and points of entry. We have a timeline when we implement the ceasefire model, <clears throat> and uh, we have to make sure that once we start working so we can monitor our results. And we're not trying to compete with nobody. I respect the work of all the groups out there working to, tr to, you know, to try to stop violence, but ceasefires definitely played a prominent role because uh, now ceasefire is working in 15 cities across the nation. We're working in England, Iraq. We're working in South Africa, Honduras. They recently uh, contracted with us to do some work in Honduras. So it all started on the west side of Chicago, though. Everything started that way, on the west side. So monitor the work, measure outcomes, risk levels, shootings, changes, and norms. So all this is important. And ceasefire's work is uh, housed at the UIC School of Public Health. So it's all about public health. I want to stress that point because, you know, you have to change mindsets. You cannot, change, you cannot change conditions and circumstances, so you have to meet the people where they are and bring them into your world, so to speak. Um, critical elements of ceasefire is the community, participants, workers, public education, and like I say, we just talked about that a little bit. But right now, the average rate of homicide in the United States is five per 100,000, and the ceasefire zone in Chicago is 34 people per 100,000. That's astronomical if you think about it. And imagine growing up as a young guy in one of these communities and 34 people out of 100,000 being shot and killed in your community. What are you going to think about? You become desensitized. It can happen to anybody because people don't have time to really think of People think about how they're going to get home once they leave the house, how they're going to get back home safe. And this is just like some of the guys we work with in the Latino community. And that young man that's profiled in the first, right in the front, he's an outreach worker now, and he was a real serious guy at one time on the streets. And we won him over. We kept spending time with him, and now he's a productive member of society. And um, like I say, the criteria is 16 to 25 years old, recently released from prison, recently shot, history of violence. We uh, pride ourselves on working with the highest risk guys for real. And that's the bottom line. And somebody has to work with them, trust me. <laughs> and so this is like an evaluation done on ceasefire and the pro pro ceasefire participants at intake. 96% gang involved. Key role in the gang was 68%. Prior criminal involvement, 62%. High risk street activity, 92%. That's just some of the numbers. But it just goes to show you unemployed, 70%. So these guys are hanging on the corner all night and day, nothing to do. So idle time brings about a devil's workshop in some cases. I don't mind. That's this old saying anyway. So, uh, so right here, the, the characteristics, you know, able to relate to the highest risk, credibility, and primary responsibilities is to identify and detect. You, may be here, you might hear me saying that word continuously because you have to identify in order to detect. You know, you cannot rest on your laurels when you're doing this kind of work because, you know, like, the streets are changing every day. Like recently there's been this here uh, social media frenzy with uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Guys in Chicago are posting these YouTube videos. We had a story about this guy named Chief Keith. 
He just signed a million dollar record deal with Interscope Records, but he signed the record deal because if you look at the content in his YouTube video, it's all about violence. So there's another little rapper named Little Jojo who actually posted some uh, violent content in his video, YouTube, thinking he would get a few million hits and then he could get a record deal. But instead he lost his life because he threatened some guys on Chief Keith's side and he ended up being shot and killed the very next day because people are not thinking when they put this stuff out there on YouTube. So that's been a recent, one of the recent findings that we've been able to identify that's helped escalate more homicides in Chicago, believe it or not. There's been a direct link to that. So this is like the, the Six Fire Inglewood office. You got all the staff standing out there. So we have teams in each community. Even though we're housed out of UIC, we have satellite offices in the, in the community in which we work in. And uh, what community program managers, their main job is to mobilize the community build coalitions, organize volunteers, and uh, do a lot of paperwork as well. And then the outreach worker supervisor component, well, you know, it's like up close in your face personal type of work. And then the outreach workers, they carry a caseload of 15 high-risk individuals each. And the reason why it's 15 high-risk individuals each because you know and I know you can't work with everybody. One outreach worker can uh, serve as 15 guys and females in a serious way because we want to make sure we have the quality of impact within their lives. So if a guy is working with 200 people, he's not going to have no quality work. So that's the reason why it's 15 per uh, outreach worker. And uh, as far as the violence interrupters, like I said, I organized, I created the violence interrupters because I wanted to stop shootings on the front end. So what I did, the university said they wanted to really stop the violence in Chicago by using a public health model. So over in Cambodia about a year ago, they had some active, uh, believe it or not, they had some active prostitutes sitting on a panel at an AIDS conference. <laughs> they had active prostitutes educating young people in the audience about their high-risk behavior and how it can lead to AIDS. And the reason I hired some of the ex-offenders, same, took a page out of the same book. You know, we hire ex-offenders who have a history of violence who turned their lives around to stop guys that are currently committing acts of violence, and it worked out. And in 2004, and like I say, not to take all the credit, I made a prediction in the Chicago Tribune in 2004 that there would be 150 less homicides in Chicago. And in 2004, there were 151 less homicides in Chicago. I made that prediction in the Chicago Tribune. That's the year that I created the violence interrupters as well. Now, the police did a lot of work, too. I don't want to take nothing from the police, okay? But the thing is, there's a direct relation to the work we do in getting the homicides down, okay? So... With that, then as far as the hospital program, this is major for ceasefire. It's a new addition. When I say new, we've been working in hospitals for about four years now. Ceasefire has been around since 2000. But we go to the hospital, and some of the toughest scenes you've ever had to encounter is at a hospital when you got 30 to 50 family members at a hospital talking about retaliating because their loved one was shot and injured. So that's some tough stuff there. So recently, we've had the doctors come out and talk to some of the high-risk youth with us, which is all about changing the norm. If you can change the norm and meet them, they call it the golden hour when the guys are at the hospitals, the golden hour, to try to get them to stop and put their change the way they think. And we've been successful. We've, uh, we had to go visit about 600 patients in the year 2011 at the hospitals, though. It's some tough work. I mean, when you go there and you see the, the graphic nature of what's going on. So we partnered with the right partners. And um, how much more time do I have, though? I, I want to make sure, okay, okay, we're good, because I'll get long-winded sometimes, sorry about that. So partners, community-based organizations, hospitals, health departments, faith leaders, law enforcement and service providers. It's all about networking and, and uh, connecting people with coalitions. As, as a matter of fact, what the outreach workers do, if they got a guy that has a substance abuse issue, it's real simple, basic social service work. They connect them with a social, I mean, a substance abuse center which is good because we have those people connected with us. And the major issue we're finding out now is that uh, seeking, getting employment for these young men is just hard. It's not easy because a lot of people do not want to hire these guys with uh, the ex-offenders. So that's the reason why we've hired a lot of the guys. And I must admit, over the years, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Chicago Police Department, FBI, all those law enforcement agencies, at one time they looked at us and they were very skeptical of our work. But over the years, we've been able to show them that we do some quality work and now they support our work. I have a good relationship with U.S. Attorney Patrick Fitzgerald, which he recently stepped down. And it was amazing because a lot of people wouldn't think that a guy from ceasefire would actually talk to law enforcement like that. But it's important because if you want to show a unified front, everybody has to be on the same page. And then the police accept us for the work that we do. U.S. Attorney Fitzgerald didn't try to tell me nothing like, well, you guys need to do it this way or that way. What he did tell me, though, is that he heard a lot of our guys' names being mentioned on these wiretaps. He couldn't give me all the information. Now, hear, hear me clearly on this message. And when he said that, he didn't say it in a negative way. 
He said, this here means that your workers are meeting with the right people. That's what he said. He said, because I hear their names on wiretaps every now and then. They never arrested any of our people, not the U.S. attorney. So that goes to show you that our people are out there really in the mix. But it's dangerous work because you have to watch what you say, watch what you do. But I'm, I appreciate this U.S. attorney giving me that little bit of information. So law enforcement is definitely is, is a critical element of, of working a, with ceasefire. And uh, the mission, any, uh, when we work with community organizations, their mission has to be consistent with our mission because a lot of times people, like I said before, they say they want to work with ceasefire, but they don't understand the magnitude of the work. This is 24-hour work sometimes. The outreach workers work from 2 o'clock to 10 p.m. on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and from 4 to midnight on Fridays and Saturdays. And sometimes the interrupters are out there working all the way to 2 o'clock in the morning. This is the kind of work, it's, it's kind of tough. It's just like being a police officer to a degree. And then the hospital program, and then faith-based leaders, that's Cardinal George, and we had a covenant for peace and action where we brought out about 170 pastors, and they signed on to our covenant. Cardinal George, one day the Latino brothers were at war on the southwest side of Chicago a few years back, and I said, who would you guys listen to in order to put your guns down? And one of the Latino guys said, we'll listen to Cardinal George, <laughs> and it was kind of strange. I said, you know what, I didn't know Cardinal George at the time, so I had to put my thinking cap on and find out who knew Cardinal George. And I had a connect, I got a guy to connect me with the Cardinal. I went over, I, I sat down with the Cardinal for about an hour and a half, and I, he gave me an hour and a half of his time. That's exceptional. So I, obviously I was talking, right, making a little sense to him, right? And he came out to the Southwest community with me to meet with both of them rival gangs out there, and I couldn't believe it. And you know what the gangs talk, start talking to the Cardinal about? You, you're not going to believe this. Instead of them talking about the peace process, they start confessing their sins. I'm not joking. They start confessing. The Cardinal said, hold up, I'm not here for that. He said, they said, hold up, I'm not here for that. Let's try to work on the peace process. But it goes to show you the power of being connected with people because the Cardinal came out and the guys, they didn't believe me at first that I could get the Cardinal. And once he came out, that gave me some straight credibility with them Latino gangs. They say, this is the guy that brought the Cardinal out to talk to us and they never forget it. They took pictures with the Cardinal, they took the pictures home and now their family feels proud of them. And most important, the Cardinal told them, even though he came out, he may not be able to come out, you know, all the time, but just think about what, what he talked to them about and keep the cardinal in, in, their, in their minds when they're thinking about committing an act of violence. That was major on behalf of ceasefire back then. And um, right here, you know, like I said, we talked about the job training, law enforcement, official shooting data, they provide us with the data. And my relationship with law enforcement is up and down, but it's okay. Like I said, we're getting, we're making progress because we have a new superintendent in Chicago. It took a little while to get McCarthy to win him over a little bit, but right now we're doing pretty good for Superintendent McCarthy in Chicago. And that's a blessing. And uh, this is some of our public education information, don't shoot, I want to grow up. That's one of the most uh, prominent uh, posters you might see in Chicagoland. And um, a lot of people look at these flyers, stop shooting, stop killing. Multiple audiences require multiple consistent messages. But no matter what I say up here today, we still have a lot of work to do as it relates to really trying to like, get the violence down in Chicago and throughout the nation. Because at any given time, like in Aurora, Colorado, the guy uh, bust into the movie theater and shot people. Chicago, you got 400 homicides. Warriors, Mexico, you got oh, like 1,800 like homicides. One year they had about 1,800. So the beat goes on, but if we can change the way people think on a universal level, I think we can really get somewhere and start treating the issue of violence as a public health issue. I think the world can make a lot of progress that way. And don't get me wrong, if a guy shoots and kills somebody, he should be punished for that. I'm not saying let a guy, I'm saying stop it before it happens. And if we can get some ceasefire curriculum in the schools at an early age, and try to really deprogram young people before they even get to that level. And so when I was talking to Diane Sawyer, what I shared with her, one thing that's really needed, in my opinion, is an institution of higher learning right in the heart of the community where you can host about 1,000 young men and women right there in the neighborhood and keep them in there with you 24 hours a day until they get the message. It's going to take a real, real diligent and real sincere effort such as that because it's hard out here because once you meet with the guys, they go right back to ground zero. They get misled by their peers and everything. And recently in Chicago, we've had honor roll students being shot and killed. And that's something different because there was a time when some of the good guys, they can go on and go to school and do pretty good in their lives. So it definitely spreads like an infectious disease, okay? So community mobilization there and um, the documentation, these are some conflict forms. And ceasefire evaluation, I'll say this right before I end. So it showed that the ceasefire evaluation decreased shootings and killings, broke down gang networks, but we didn't really break down gang networks. What happened, the gangs began talking to us and we were able to kind of get through and get them to help us stop some of the violence. Decreased retaliatory homicides, made shooting hotspots cooler, and made neighborhoods safer. 
This is one of our first communities in the Arvin Gresham community. If you can see the map on this side, the, the, the deep red in the, in the middle there, and you see how it cooled out after ceasefire. So this is like data in a, based on our evaluation, how we were able to cool them spots down. And then outcomes of our survey with the independent evaluation. Of clients surveyed, 99% reported ceasefire had a positive impact on their lives. Participants who sought help from the outreach workers for education, getting out of a gang, getting a job, were more likely to have received more education. We got them out of the gangs and they're doing pretty good. And this was an evaluation from the Department of Justice. Outreach workers were mentioned second only to the parents as the most important persons in the participants' lives. So our outreach workers came in number second in their lives. And our outcomes of program, so 76 reported they had a problem, 87% received assistance in all those different categories. Okay, outcomes of the Baltimore uh, program, less acceptance of gun use to settle grievances, fewer homicides, 80% of respondents reported that their lives were better since becoming part of the uh, Safe Streets program in Baltimore. So, you know, the B goes on, and these are the evaluations in Baltimore, 56% reduction in homicides, 26% reduction in homicides there. But th to be honest with you, we've been working in Baltimore for some years now, so the reductions did not come overnight. Okay, this just to give you some like data to back up what I'm talking about. And that's what ceasefire is all about. And I want to thank everybody for listening. I try to be as entertaining as possible. And uh, thanks again for having me out here. Okay, thank you all. We've got, uh, we've got time for a couple of questions. Does anyone have any questions? Phil, yes, sir, in the back. Wait for the microphone and, he, and she'll get it to you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, T.O., for that. I'm actually from the south side of Chicago, okay. the first and true. Uh, you touched on it briefly, but I was wondering if you could give a little more context to yeah. Renaissance 2010 and the destabilization of neighborhoods through gentrification, yeah. and if you can further expand on how that leads into the violence, because I, your presentation was awesome, and I like how humble you were and mm -hmm. even taking a lot of credit, but can you kind of give that context so people understand what Renaissance 2010 was and as well as the breaking down of the communities like Henry Horner, like Robert Taylor's, even 79th Corridor where I stay, that gave birth to a lot of this violence. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to go too deep, but I could go deep now. <laughs> now, what happened with Renaissance 2010, you know, you just had some people in power that made decisions to close down schools and shift students to other sides of the neighborhood. Like, for example, the Austin community is on the west side, far west side of Chicago. They closed down Austin for freshmen and for I think it was juniors, okay? And some, 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 for some reason, they said they're going to transfer the freshmen and the juniors to Orr High School. No, not Orr, Clemente High School, which is on Western and Division in the Latino community. So you transfer an African-American students from the far west side. They had to get on the bus and go all the way to a Latino area. It led to straight a trail of blood. Period. You had young guys that dropped out of school, young guys that were killed, young guys that were shot and beat up every day of the week. And the same thing happened in about maybe 30 different schools throughout Chicago, and there's a trail of blood that follows it that you wouldn't even want to really talk about. But what happens is when you have leaders that are not really directly connected to what's going on on the streets, then sometimes you make decisions from a distance that don't really work out and help people out. I believe the, good, the leaders had good intentions, but they didn't do a lot of their homework when it came down to the actual problems in the community because you had young guys that were part of gangs that go to them schools too, and they end up being transferred. They created havoc on a lot of those blocks out there. So hopefully that answers your question. But I didn't have time to give you all the history lesson on the, on the history of gang violence in Chicago because Chicago is just a tough place. Like I said, it's the birthplace of the major gangs throughout our nation. When you get finished talking, uh, Jeff Ford, he's down in uh, Florence, Colorado, and Larry Hoover right now. But those guys, the young guys fighting now, they don't even know what they're fighting for. They never met those leaders. And when you had leaders, you had more homicides, though. I want to make that clear. The numbers don't lie. You had 900 homicides in the 70s, 900 in the 80s, and 900 in the 90s. But in the year 2011, you had about 435. So we've come a long way. But when they tore down the projects, a lot of people were dispersed throughout the city, and they had their value systems, and then it led to increased violence as well. But recently, Chicago, we all have to come together once again to try to get the homicides back down in Chicago. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Question yeah. right here, Mary. Okay. Thank you. In uh, your efforts to mobilize in the community, have there been a campaign to get the faith leaders and family members, because I'm thinking of the grandmother, yeah. to support the family to say it's not all right to have guns in the home? It yeah. seems like that's perhaps an untapped area 
And I wonder if you could tell us that there have been things going on there. No, we do it all the time. We work with Father Flager on the south side, a very prominent uh, Catholic uh, priest. And uh, we work with Father Flager in regards to getting the grandparents and the, and the family members to tell guys that uh, they shouldn't have them guns in the households because it starts in the home. You're right. But we've been mobilizing the community for years. We have a, a database of about 10,000 supporters that hit the streets with us whenever we need them. They may not hit it all, not 10,000 at one time, but 500 here, 300 people there. And the message is pretty strong with that. It's just, see, Chicago has some of the strongest laws, handgun laws, but nobody's really respecting the laws in Chicago. We've got a question right here. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed the, the talk. Um, I have a question for you. Do you all um, survey the, the people that you serve, that, that, that receive services from your organization to see if, like to ask what type of music they listen to? And I ask that as a loaded question. So I think about like gangster rap music. Like, I mean, that's what I grew up listening to. I, I listened to gangster rap and gospel. Like it doesn't make sense, but that it, it was the purest form of truth that artists could express to me, so it made sense, right? So I hear people talking about violence, and then I also listen to the other, the other thing. But listening to that violent music, I felt loaded, like, to respond to violence with, with more violence. So, like, we all grew up fighting and all those. It was just a part of our lifestyle, like, where I, where I came from. So I think about now, I know that there's a freedom of speech and, 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 and those types of things. We can't completely take violence from TV and movies, but the value of life is not value. There's no value put on life in, in, in rap music, but that is the most credible thing with young black males. That's, who, that's what we listen to. I remember when the fight with Tupac and, and Miss C. Dolores Tucker, who was a senator, well, a well-accomplished black woman senator, right? And she was saying, we got to stop calling women bees and, and, and hoes in music, right? And Tupac responded to her with an eloquent, that's why we call them song. You, you probably know this song. Yeah, yeah. However, there, there's no debates like that happening now. There, there's, no, there's no conversations happening now. So I'm wondering, is that something that you can establish that data by asking your people that you're serving, what type of music are you listening to? What type of shows are you listening to? And then we can say, you know what? Something has to be done in some kind of way to control the media that these at-risk youth are being exposed to. They listen to music all day. You hear a pastor once a week. Okay, so I'll make it quick. Yeah, what happened with that, the social media entertainment industry, uh, believe it or not, before rap, you had a lot of violent movies out. So I don't know if there's a direct link to the rap music and the violence in the communities. It's all about changing the mindsets because guys are going to listen to gangster rap. They're going to listen to some love songs or whatever the case may be. That doesn't mean you have to hurt somebody. But I do believe maybe 1% of the time you get a youth that gets, you know, gets to smoking that stuff and he goes to shoot somebody. But there's no direct link to it. But we are looking to doing a survey, though, to find out the music. Because uh, it's crazy. Rap music is, is, is new, you know, uh, and that's what's going on. The young people uh, really take to the music, but I don't see the music making them actually act crazy. I just don't see no direct, because that's the case. Even back in the Tupac era and N.W.A., the brothers out of uh, Compton, <laughs> they said, well, that's the case when you watch an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, that makes you want to kill people, right? I mean, this is what's said. You know, they had John Wayne before Arnold Schwarzenegger, so people were not like, watching John Wayne movies saying, I'm going to go kill somebody, right? Uh, young guys really need a lot of help. That's what's happening. Okay. Well, let's yeah. give T.O. Yeah. a round of applause, and those with further questions can come.